going to talk about a um, yeah, reduction of structure to parabolic subgroups for torsos of uh, semi-simple groups. So we're going to take a, a torso over a field or a cohomology class over a field and check if it uh, is coming from a torso on some proper parabolic subgroup. Uh, we'll start with the motivation and the context for why is this question interesting. Uh, on the one hand, I mean, at least historically, it is connected to the classification of semi-simple groups. And on the other hand, it is, we'll see, especially in the proofs and in the examples, a lot of the connections between uh, classical groups and different algebraic structures like quadratic forms or um, Algebras with involution. So yeah, let's uh, let's start. Oh, so first, a little bit of notation. Um, so G is going to be a semi-simple group over a field of characteristic not two. Uh, some of this stuff works for reductive groups, but almost all of our results are about semi-simple groups. So to simplify things, we'll just talk about semi-simple groups. Uh, G is called isotropic if it admits a proper parabolic subgroup. Okay. Um, capital K will denote an arbitrary field extension of small k. And as usual, H1 uh, denote the Galois cohomology of our group uh, G. Okay. Um, so the context. Uh, is the work of Tits on the classification of simple group groups. In particular, uh, one of the last papers he published on this subject, um, he asked the following question. Uh, so here G is a simple uh, algebraic group. And the question is, does G admit an anisotropic form, uh, G twisted by gamma, where gamma is a G torso? Okay. So uh, notice that these are not all inner forms of G, okay? Because we, because we are not taking um, co-cycles in the adjoint group, okay? We're specifically asking about G torses. And uh, these groups come up naturally in the classification of, uh, of semi-simple and simple groups, this kind of forms. Uh, Actually, Titz was interested in this uh, for a reason. He was trying to prove, for those of you who know what the Titz index is, he was trying to prove that a certain, uh, that the form of E8 uh, exists with a certain uh, Titz index. Um, yeah. Anyway, in the same paper, he uh, proved the following theorem. So he answered this in the case where uh, G is split and simply connected. Uh, so assume G is split and simply connected, then G admits such an anisotropic form as in the question, if and only if it is not uh, isomorphic to either special linear group, uh, symplectic group, or uh, spin 10. Okay, so, and what I want to uh, emphasize here is that it, it, it's kind of easy to see why these are going to be exceptions, okay? The question is why are these all the exceptions? Uh, so, uh, and, and that's what it's, that was the work that Titz did in that paper. Uh, he actually constructed uh, these anisotropic forms uh, for all other groups, okay? So maybe I'll just say quickly, um, why are these exceptions? So, the special linear groups and the symplectic groups don't admit any non-trivial torsos over fields. So, uh, of course, this, we, we can't find an anisotropic form. Okay, all, all twists are going to be uh, split. And for spin 10, this is um, a consequence of a classical theorem of uh, Pfister on the isotropy of 10-dimensional uh, forms with the trivial discriminant and split Clifford algebra, okay? So he proved those such forms are isotropic and that's why uh, spin 10 comes up here, even though it is not a special group. 
Anyway, so this work is a generalization of this, of Titz's work and it's building on it. We don't have alternative proofs for what he did, uh, but we kind of generalized it. And uh, in particular, we are able to answer this question in the case without the adjectives that uh, G is split or simply connected. Uh, so in general, for simple groups, we can answer this question. Um, yeah, and a little bit partially for semi-simple groups. Okay, so uh, let me give you the main definition uh, for this talk, which is not standard. So um, a G-toser gamma is called isotropic if it lies in the image of uh, the induced map on cohomology um, from the inclusion of some parabolic subgroup uh, P of G, some proper parabolic subgroup. So I'm asking if um, gamma is induced from some P torsor, some other P torsor, where P is some proper parabolic subgroup. And in such a situation, we say that uh, gamma admits adduction of structure to P. Okay, so this is the main Definition, if this is not clear, please stop me. In general, stop me if something is not clear. Uh, but here it is very important. If you don't understand what I'm saying, then you should stop me and ask. Okay. Um, so why is this a sensible uh, definition? Let's see a few examples. So first of all, uh, kind of formally, uh, we can say G is isotropic if and only if the trivial G torso uh, is isotropic. Okay, um, remember that a, a semi-simple group G is isotropic if, admits, if it admits a proper parabolic subgroup. Okay, so I think this should be clear. Um, o and torsors classify um, orthogonal forms and uh, the corresponding, so the quadratic form is, is isotropic if and only if the corresponding orthogonal form is isotropic. This is O N. Uh, PGLN torsors classify uh, simple simple algebras, and uh, algebra um, has zero divisors if and only if the torsor um, is isotropic, or equivalently, if you want, um, you can say that the algebra has the the norm form of the algebra is isotropic if and only if the torsor is isotropic, and this continues. Okay, so. The projective symplectic group, uh, its torsors classify simple, uh, central simple algebras with the symplectic involution. And again, this notion co uh, coincides with the classical notion of isotropy. And uh, we have one example from the exceptional case here, uh, from the exceptional groups. So if G is split of type F4, uh, then G torsors classify Albert algebras. And the G torsor is isotropic if and only if the corresponding algebra has nil potents. Okay, uh, so I haven't had time to go into. No, no not is nil potent. Admits nil potents. What do you mean? Why? Has has what? Admits admits nil potents. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Sorry. So what? But what is the takeaway here? Um, so, first of all, this notion is kind of generalization of uh, uh, notions of isotropy for semi-simple groups, uh, quadratic forms, uh, involutions on, on uh, simple algebras in a certain way. And also it is, I think it is just, we care about these questions many times in practice, is it particular torsor admit reduction of structure to some or parabolic subgroup like these has have concrete uh, meanings on the side of the algebraic structures uh, classified by those sources. Uh, so, but I want to connect uh, this definition with the work of uh, of Tits. Um, so, this lemma is the connection. It will give us two new ways to look at at um, what it means to be isotropic. So here, uh, gamma is a G torsor. Uh, P is a parabolic subgroup. 
So uh, we have two equivalent uh, conditions to gamma admitting reduction of structure to P. So the first condition is uh, we can twist G by gamma and check if it has a parabolic P prime of the same type as P. Okay, uh, so that is one condition. And the second condition is we can look at uh, uh, G modulo P. The, um, this is a, it's called the generalized flag variety. We can again twist it by gamma and ask if that has a K point. So um, the proof of this is not, I don't think it, it's not hard, especially the equivalence between two and, uh, and three. Uh, you need to use, so it's kind of a basic twisting argument and you use the fact that parabolics are self-normalizing. Um, now, what is the conclusion here? So the conclusion is coming from point two here. Uh, so in particular, if gamma is isotropic, then the twist of G by gamma is isotropic. Okay, I think this uh, is clear from point two. And when G is quasi split, uh, meaning it admits uh, a broad subgroup, then the converse implication holds as well. Um, why? Because uh, if G is quasi split, then it uh, has parabolics of all types. Okay, so if the twisted group is isotropic and it has some proper parabolic P prime, then I can find some parabolic uh, P of the same type in G and then condition two will apply. Okay, so and this, so this condition two now say, is saying uh, for split groups, okay, or quasi split groups, it is saying that uh, a G toaster is isotropic if and only if this twisted form is isotropic. Okay, so we see that in the uh, quasi split case, these two things are equivalent and this is the connect, uh, connection with the Titus work. So this immediately uh, gives us from Titus theorem the following corollary. Uh, so the only split simple, simply connected groups, which do not admit anisotropic torsos, are the special linear groups, the symplectic groups, and spin 10. Okay, why? Oops, uh, sorry. So because we saw that for split groups, having a, a like for a, a torso of, a, of a, sim, a split group to be anisotropic is exactly the same thing as this twisted uh, group being isotropic, okay? And so this follows directly from uh, what Titus proved. Uh, yeah, uh, I guess I want to say also at this point, uh, two things. So first of all, point three is, is very useful this point of view given in point three here, even though I'm not gonna talk about it a lot, we use it a lot because these flag varieties have been studied a lot in the literature and they're uh, classified for different groups. Uh, um, there's a nice paper of uh, uh, Merkuriev, uh, Panin and Wadsworth on uh, index reduction uh, for sem semi-simple groups where they do, that is, we refer to that paper a lot for index reduction formulas, but also for the classification of, uh, uh, of these flag varieties. So that is useful. And the second thing to note here is that, so now that we have this, the examples from before, uh, we can have some kind of concrete uh, meaning for this corollary, okay? so. Uh, again, the main point here is that any other split simple simply connected group does admit anisotropic torsos. Okay, so for example, spin 12 admits uh, anisotropic torsos. So that, that uh, concretely, that means that there exists some uh, 12 dimensional quadratic form with trivial discriminant and split Clifford algebra, which is not isotropic, okay, which is anisotropic. Yeah, I hope this is clear. So that is going to be the flavor of, of what we do throughout. Um, it's kind of translating these statements to the algebraic structures uh, uh, side. Okay. 
Um, so this is the connection with the, what Titsus did. Let me now state the main problem. So in general, we are interested in classifying um, sorry, these, uh, the groups which do not admit anisotropic torsos. So um, Titsus uh, classified them in the simple, simply connected split case. And we are interested in them asking the more general question. Um, so we're going to call a semi-simple group G uh, strongly isotropic if it does not admit any anisotropic torsos. Okay, if all of its torsos are isotropic, and we are just interested in classifying these. Okay, so I'll give you a, a, a moment to internalize this uh, notation for the purpose of this talk because I don't want you to forget what I'm talking about uh, later. So a group is strongly isotropic if it uh, does not admit any anisotropic torsos. All torsos admit reduction of structure to some parabolic, proper parabolic subgroup, okay? And one remark I kind of, I have to make at this point is that, um, so G is strongly isotropic if and only if it admits a proper parabolic subgroup such that uh, the induced map on Galois cohomology is a bijection for all field extensions, okay? So in the definition, I'm not, I'm saying for every torsor, there exists some parabolic to which it admits reduction of structure, uh, but in fact, there is some universal one, okay? To which every torsor uh, admits reduction of structure. So that is seen, uh, using that is shown using uh, results of Zinovi on versatile torsos. Uh, you choose some parabolic to which the versatile versal torsor admits a reduction of structure and that gives you the map here. Um, so that explains why this is a subjection and in general, okay, I'm not going to explain why it is a bijection, but it is a bijection. In general, uh, the induced map from any parabolic subgroup is going to be injective. So that is uh, kind of well known, but I'm not going to extend it um, because I'm not going to use it. Uh, okay, so let's state the main result. So first of all, we have the classification in the simple case, we kind of complete what uh, Tietz has started. So uh, the simple strongly isotropic groups over a, a field with characteristic not two are the symplectic groups, spin groups of 10 dimensional quadratic forms with trivial discriminant and split Clifford algebra. And um, SLN over some division algebra where I allow modding out by a central cyclic subgroup with this, and with this um, criterion on the order of the the subgroup that some prime divisor of n does not divide d. Okay, so this is the classification in the simple case. Okay, Oops, sorry. Uh, I'm not going to have time to go into a lot of details about the proofs. I mean, I'm not going to actually show the part of any of these proofs of, of the, sorry, of any of the, yeah, any of the proofs today. Uh, but there is a preprint on the archive. Uh, we can find all the details. And I hope I can still give you some kind of flavor, uh, at least an outline of what the proofs look like. So any question, uh, questions about this uh, theorem, this, this statement of this theorem? So what happens in the simply connected case? So in the simply connected case, uh, we have, um, the, the symplectic groups, these spin groups are all simply connected. And then we have also the uh, special linear groups of, so inner forms of uh, SLN. Yeah. Any other question? Okay. Um, Let's talk about the semi-simple case. So here we have a partial uh, classification. 
now G is a semi-simple group, okay? And we have this uh, assumption on the root system of G. So for any simple factor of G of type A N minus one, the integer N is square free, okay? That means we don't allow, for example, groups isogenous to SLN squared or something like that, okay? So a uh, strong assumption, then uh, G is strongly isotropic if and only if it admits a simple strongly isotropic quotient. Okay, this is kind of the best reduction possible, this conclusion. So once you know the root system of G, it's very easy to determine what are its uh, simple strongly isotropic quotients and then use the classification from before. Uh, and this, this uh, assumption is necessary here. So for example, uh, here is an example showing that the assumption is necessary. Here G is SLP times SLP squared, modded out by a uh, central, the diagonal uh, cyclic subgroup of uh, yeah, roots of unity. Uh, so this group is strongly isotropic, but it does not admit uh, strongly isotropic simple quotients. It is not very hard to check that. Um, if we'll get to see some examples of how this uh, theorem goes at the end, I think we might be even able to explain why this is the case, but it is a good exercise. Um, yeah, in the, in the preprint, there is also a kind of combinatorial criterion for when is a split semi-simple group of type A, so the type we are restricting here, uh, strongly isotropic. But that criterion is kind of complicated and it gets complicated very quickly as the number of factors grow. Um, so I really don't think that, I mean, once you try to relax these assumptions, the kind of statements you get, get very complicated very quickly. You can still maybe say something, but it, it stops being interesting. Uh, any questions on this uh, theorem? Okay, so one question you should have asked me is why, why is like, where does this restriction comes in? Uh, so I hope I'll get to that later, but I'll give a spoiler that it's basically coming from the period index uh, problem. Okay, so groups of type A, um, of course, central simple algebras come in and then uh, there's the period index problem which complicates uh, things here. But we'll see that later. Uh, so let me give a sketch of the proof for um, uh, the first classification theorem uh, for simple groups. Again, I won't go into all of the details. I, won't, I almost won't give any proofs at all. So yeah, we started a few reductions. Um, the first thing we do is we look at, uh, um, um, yeah, subjections of subjective homomorphisms of uh, semi-simple groups. So here we have a subjective homomorphism. For me, subjective means when you take points over the algebraic closure, it is subjective, okay? P is some parabolic subgroup uh, containing the kernel and gamma is a G torsor, okay? Then the first statement here is uh, gamma admit, admits reduction of structure to P, if and only if it's pushed forward, admits reduction of structure to uh, the image of P, okay? And uh, this is, um, it's kind of, it's very elementary, easy to see on the level of core cycles. And then uh, the second point here is assume that either uh, pi is separable, okay, or the kernel is central. We are always assuming G is reductive. Uh, then if H is strongly isotropic, so is G, okay? Uh, so let me explain, uh, how to see two from one. So 
assume the age is strongly isotropic and choose any uh, G tosser gamma, you can push it forward to uh, age and that also will be isotropic, right? So it will admit reduction of structure to some parabolic subgroup. And then from one, uh, if you look at the inverse image of that parabolic subgroup, gamma will admit reduction of structure to that inverse image. And then the, the only problem that could be is the inverse image might not be uh, defined over small k, okay? So that is why we need this assumption so that the inverse images of parabolic subgroups in H are parabolic subgroups in G. Any uh, uh, questions on that? Okay, um, so these are, point two here is especially useful. It will reduce the number of cases we have to look at. It's a significant reduction. And also uh, a very important corollary uh, is the following. So we have the canonical subjection onto the adjoint group. This is how I denote the adjoint group of G. Okay, G bar. Uh, so from point one here, uh, G also is isotropic if and only if it's pushed forward along this uh, subjection is isotropic. If it's pushed forward to that joint group is isotropic. So does, what does this mean? It means that all the groups between G and that joint group to understand what does it mean for a torso there to be isotropic, it's enough to understand what happens. What is, uh, when is the torso of that joint group isotropic? And this is, simplifies uh, things a lot. We use it all the time, it's kind of central. Um, now one final reduction, basically connecting to Tissa's work. So a strongly isotropic uh, simple group G is of type AN, CN, or D5. So this is, saying, okay, we, uh, we, we only need to start doing work where it's uh, stopped. Okay, we can rely on what he did. Uh, so I include the proof here because it is very simple and quick. So first of all, we extend scalars to the algebraic closure to split our group uh, G. Uh, it will remain strongly isotropic because we are considering less sources by passing to the algebraic closure. Okay, so all of them are going to be isotropic. Then by the lemma we just saw, the universal cover of this group is going to be strongly isotropic as well because it covers a strongly isotropic group, okay? Um, so that universal cover is uh, simply connected, simple, split, and it does not admit any anisotropic uh, torsos, right? All of its torsos are, are isotropic. So from Titz's uh, theorem, it has to be isomorphic to either um, SLN, SPN, SP2N, or uh, D5, or, or SPIN10, sorry. So these are the three, so its root system is of one of these types, okay? Now therefore G is of one of the, the of th G is of one of these types as well, because, okay, these operations, extending scalars going to the universal cover don't change the, type of the root system. Okay, I uh, hope this is uh, clear. So what does this mean? So now we are left with three families of classical groups, okay? And we need to determine which of them are strongly isotropic under which conditions and so on. And the way we do that, okay, so we, uh, in, each of the, in each one of the cases, so that uh, it is known okay, in general that these classical groups, the torsos classify algebraic structures. Okay, so they classify uh, quadratic forms or more generally uh, orthogonal involutions on uh, central symbol algebra and, and, and so on. So, in each one of these cases, we translate the notion of isotropy of G torsos to the 
to, to get some notion of what does it mean for the corresponding algebraic structure to be isotropic. And then we get a statement, our, our theorem boils down to something like there exists an anisotropic uh, uh, orthogonal form, orthogonal involution or some algebraic structure over some field extension, if and only if some criteria is met. So then we just need to roll up our sleeves and go case by case and prove these existence uh, theorems. So I, I included here on this very overloaded slide an overview of uh, what it boils down to. Uh, this is the last slide for this the classification of uh, of uh, simple groups. So we can take our time here. Uh, let me explain what are we looking at. I know it's too much on one slide. Um, so the first the first two columns are the the different cases we can reduce to, okay, and the last two columns are the uh, the theorems. The existence theorems we need to prove in that case. Okay, uh, and I will also explain what are these groups here. Uh, and in general, I am following here the book of involutions. Okay, so the book of involution is like a, a constant reference in every paragraph. I think of this of the preprint, for example. So you can see that from the fact that we are using all of these groups are. Uh, groups of isometries of, or something like that of uh, algebra with involution, except for the last case here. So we are using that connection all the time. Uh, but let's look at, let me explain how to read this, uh, this table. So let's look at the second row. So here we're looking at type C. We can reduce to the uh, simply connected case. And then every uh, simply connected um, group here is going to be the symplectic group. So the group of isometries often uh, central simple algebra with a symplectic involution. So here A is a sim central simple algebra and sigma is a symplectic involution. And then what is the theorem we need to prove? Uh, we need to prove, so the anisotropic structure is anisotropic symplectic involutions uh, on A, but we remember we allow extension of uh, scalars to arbitrary fields. And then the theorem is there exists such an anisotropic symplectic involution if and only if A is not split. Okay, so uh, if we know this, it is easy to reduce the case of type C to this statement. Okay, uh, the classification for simple groups. Um, so let me do another row here just for, then maybe I'll talk a little bit about the proof. So in case, uh, in type D5, again, we reduce to the simply connected case. We get spin groups of uh, central simple algebras with an orthogonal involution. And then we get uh, the theorem we need to prove is there exists an anisotropic orthogonal evolution uh, tau on a with the same Clifford algebra and the same uh, discriminant as sigma, if and only if uh, A is not split or the discriminant uh, is not uh, uh, trivial or the Clifford algebra is not split. And here the Clifford algebra, uh, okay, so this is the even Clifford algebra for um, orthogonal involutions. Um, yeah. A good reference for that uh, generalization is uh, again the book of involution. Uh, if you are not comfortable, if you've never seen an algebra with an involution in your life, you can look <laughs> at the case where um, A is uh, split, then this becomes the spin group of some quadratic form. And we are saying there exists some other quadratic form with the same uh, Clifford invariant and the same discriminant if and only if the discriminant is not trivial or the Clifford uh, invariant is not trivial of that original quadratic form. Yeah, questions? I have more to say, but uh, question, question. So the field K, big K, you're, you're free to choose that. Yes, exactly, exactly. So the point here is that these might be look, look like very interesting theorems, 
but I'm not, pro I'm not promising anything about K. Okay, I'm not promising anything about it. So for example, in the symplectic case here, uh, so if A is split, then symplectic involutions are all hyperbolic because all uh, symplectic forms uh, are hyperbolic. And if A is split, what the proof goes like, we just, uh, we use index reduction formulas to assume that uh, A, so to go to some field extension where A becomes a quaternion algebra. Okay. Uh, after extending scalars, we can assume A is a quaternion algebra. And then this becomes an elementary uh, exercise in kind of constructing quadratic forms. Uh, you, uh, kind of by hand on quaternion algebras, okay? Over some big field extension. Uh, so. Okay, uh, so as, as big field extension, can, can you can you use, uh, you know, iterated Lorentz series? Sorry? You know, what, you know uh, in, in this, this paper of uh, 1990, because the way for T to, to construct a, a so-called strongly anisotropic uh, forms mm -hmm. uh, was to use Briatis theory, and, and in particular, uh, he, he, he was he was working with uh, with fields of uh, Laurent series or iterated Laurent series. Uh, yeah. Is that the same here? So uh, we don't. So no, it's not because. It, Fundamentally, he was kind of interested in a different dimension. He was uh, kind of, he used that to go from one group to the next, right? To add a vertex to the thinking diagram. Um, uh, we are kind of interested in the, in the specifics of us. So even when he was working, for example, with the spin groups, he doesn't use that theory anymore, he just goes to quadratic form theory and he constructs the anisotropic quadratic forms he needs to construct. Okay. Okay, I know I know that the paper are, have different scope, but here, I mean, uh, you can try to, to, for one of the example, to, to, to take a special capital field, special as field capital K, so, mm -hmm. some, uh, some, some, uh, some Laurent series field or iterated Laurent series field, is what I'm saying. Yeah, so we are, so there's no, what we do is we go to uh, what we use more, the kind of things we use is more the index reduction formulas and the kind of fields that come up, there are things of, uh, so to, to, to assume that A is, uh, is a quaternion algebra, you, you use uh, index reduction formula. So you go to the field of uh, functions on certain severy bar, generalized severy uh, okay, bar. So, okay, so this the is a has of difference, thank you. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a different flavor from that, and I think so. The begin the beginning, I, I really tried to imitate that first part of uh, his paper, and I could not find a way of doing it. That is why I was even got in, interested in these um, algebras with involution and this whole kind of uh, this approach, this different approach. So it's a good question. Um, yeah, so in general, but this is the flavor of the proof. So leaving aside now the last case here, the last row, where it is really uh, less interesting, I think. The first three uh, cases, so the flavor of the proof of these uh, theorems is that our condition is that something is not split. Okay, so A is not split, or the Clifford algebra is not split, or the center of uh, this. Uh, Algebra, which is an etal algebra, is not split. Uh, the general kind of uh, problem is that, on the one hand, you you won't need something to not be split because if once it splits, all torsos become isotropic. On the other hand, you don't want to deal with general algebras with orthogonal involution. That's a horrible, complicated object. So you need to kind of go to an some field extension which either partially splits, uh, so lowers the index of A, or splits maybe the, the Clifford algebra, or the, the or maybe the algebra but not the Clifford algebra. So these are these are the kind of arguments, and then it reduces once you do this kind of 
careful choosing of the field, it reduces to some elementary argument using some uh, quadratic form theory. Okay, so I will leave some time at the end uh, to come back to this for questions if you have more questions. Uh, I want to have time to just quickly. Yes, yeah, you know, going have back to Philippe's question, after you do this partial reduction, um, then it becomes similar to uh, to what Tits was doing, doesn't it? Um, then it becomes similar to what this is doing. Uh, again, so the. I mean, it's sort of a constrained generic construction. Yes, but it is not done. So yes, you are absolutely right that we, once we do that, we use universal sources and uh, or or some generic construction. But he is doing it on the side, on the very much on the. He's able to do it in generality, uh, kind of abstractly on the side of torsos. And that's not what we do here. I want to give the accurate impression that we are actually working here with quadratic forms by hand, which is, he barely does. He only does it for the classical, uh, for the DN in that uh, paper. Okay, let me just uh, quickly here, just give a flavor of the reduction because I think that is also interesting. Um, so, uh, just reminding you the theorem. So we had the reduction from the semi-simple case to the simple case under this restriction on the root system of G. Um, the reduction was that G is strongly isotropic if and only if it admits a simple strongly isotropic quotient. <laughs> so one direction here is uh, we already know, right? So if G admits a strongly isotropic quotient, so, all, so some quotient uh, is strongly isotropic, then by the lemma we saw before, uh, G is strongly isotropic as well. Okay, so that's a lemma we saw on subjective homomorphisms. Uh, so the main problem is uh, to show that if G is strongly isotropic, then it does admit some simple strongly isotropic uh, quotient. Um, okay, and the way we do this is to use uh, Brouwer invariance, which is maybe a little bit weird, and I did not expect this to uh, come in. So uh, let me just remind you what Brouwer invariants are quickly. So a Brouwer invariant uh, of G f of G is a collection of functions from G torsos to the Brouwer group, and that collection has to be functorial in field extensions of small k. So for each field extension, we get some square, uh, and we ask that square to commute, okay? If F takes the trivial torso to the identity element of the power group, F is called normalized, okay? So that means it's a morphism of pointed sets, if you like. <clears throat> and, uh, the group of normalized Brouwer invariants will be denoted uh, here for the start by invariant of G. You know, this is not the standard notation. Uh, so these are the Brouwer invariants of G. And this is a group under pointwise multiplication uh, coming from the Brouwer group. Okay, so that is the group structure. I take two Brouwer invariants and I just multiply them in the Brouwer group pointwise. Uh, Okay, uh, so this construction uh, gives a contravariant functor from the category of semi-simple groups, which I don't know what is the not if there is any notation for it, but this is how I will uh, write it to the group, the category of finite abelian groups, and a priori it's not even clear that. Uh, these groups are finite, right? It seems like a very weak condition, but just believe me that they are going to be uh, finite. Uh, so how is the, and how is, how does this functor go? So if I have a homomorphism of uh, semi-simple groups P, 
I define uh, P upper star as the pullback of a Brouwer invariant. I will call this the pullback of Brouwer invariance, or so pulling back Brouwer invariance of H to Brouwer invariance of G. And it is defined as the composition here in this diagram. So uh, I, I take a G torsor, I, I push it forward to get an H torsor, and then I apply the Brouwer invariant. Okay, that is the definition of the pullback. Any questions about this definition? No, okay. Uh, let me just, so just gonna finish now. Uh, so why are we interested in power invariants? So first of all, the um, very, uh, so when we are talking about algebraic structures like uh, central simple algebras and so on, uh, there many times they can be defined naturally. Uh, but in this context, uh, we are interested in them for because of this proposition. Um, so if we if P is a maximal simple quotient uh, of G, so what I mean by maximal simple quotient, so is that um, is that there is no other simple uh, group coming between G and Q. So there's no Q prime such that Q prime covers Q. Uh, so under this assumption, the, the pullback of power invariance uh, is injective. Okay, this is the proposition. And it follows uh, from a theorem of uh, Bellingstein and Mercurial from 2013, uh, characterizing very concretely what are the power invariants of a semi-simple group in terms of its uh, fundamental group. Uh, hmm? No, I, if, if you take G to be SLN and Q to be PGLN. So, but then it is not a maximal simple quotient, right? Because SLN is already simple. Okay, I'm saying, I'm, I'm asking that Q is maximal amongst the, the, uh, the, the, the simple quotients. That's a good question. So I cannot put any other quotient between G and Q. Is that clear? Okay, but if you take the SLN times SLN, which go to PGLN. That again is not the maximal. The maximal one will, because SLN comes in between, right? Because I can ah, do sure. SLN times okay, SLN. Okay, okay, oh, yeah, yes. Is, 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 okay, okay, well, okay, why not? Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is. Okay, so let me just, because I don't, I'm, I'm out, of, out of time. Uh, let me just put this slide up. Again, there's a lot of information here. And I will try to explain as much of it as I can. This is last slide, no more after this. Um, so this is an example of what happens in the reduction and where do power invariants come in. Um, so uh, here G is uh, SL2 times SP4, modded out by this uh, diagonal cyclic subgroup and uh, the simple quotients of, uh, of G, uh, PGL2 and PGSP4. It satisfies the condition of the theorem about the reduction to the simple case. So G is not supposed to be strongly isotopic, okay? Because these groups are not strongly isotopic. According to our classification, they admit anisotropic torsors. And we need to show that G is not uh, strongly isotropic as well. Uh, so how do we do that? Uh, we assume it is strongly isotropic and reach a contradiction. Uh, so let me just outline this. I don't know. Tell me if I should stop. I can just stop. But uh, do I have time to go over this? You can take a couple more minutes. Okay. Um, so how does this go? We take a, assume that it is strongly isotropic, then there is some proper parabolic such that uh, the parabolic, every G torsor admits reduction of structure to that parabolic. Okay, so um, then this parabolic P is necessarily of the form P1 times P2 uh, modded out by this uh, subgroup, where P1 is a parabolic subgroup of SL2 and P2 uh, is a parabolic subgroup of, parabolic subgroup of um, 
as before, simply because this, it's a general nice fact about parabolics, that the parabolics of a product are the products of the parabolics. Um, okay, then we want to get into the business of power invariance. So we push forward uh, G torsor gamma to the adjoint group. Okay, now the adjoint uh, group uh, splits as a product of PGL2 and PGSP4. So we get two cohomology classes and kind of by general principles, those will uh, correspond to a quaternion algebra. Uh, that's the PGL2 torso, an isomorphism class of quaternion algebra and uh, isomorphism class of a biquaternion algebra with a symplectic involution. Okay. And the main thing to note here is that uh, there's a natural power invariant from uh, of PGSP4 uh, sending a pair of uh, biquaternion algebra with a symplectic involution to the Bauer equivalence class of that uh, biquaternion algebra. Okay, so that will give me a Bauer invariant. Now, because the, um, the map onto PGSP4 from G is a maximal simple quotient, uh, I know the proposition says that the pullback of Bauer invariance is injective. Okay. So if I pull back this uh, Bauer invariant above, it should not be the trivial invariant, okay? Because it is not the trivial invariant of uh, PGS before. Okay, so what does that mean concretely? It means that there's some G torso gamma for which B gamma is not split. Okay, that is what this means concretely. It's exactly the same thing. Uh, now we have this uh, G torso gamma. We can twist G by it. So if we look at the twisted group of G twisted by gamma, we get uh, the special linear group of A gamma times the symplectic group of a, a biquaternion algebra with symplectic involution modded out by the same um, central subgroup. Okay, so that is easy to check. And then the standard twisting argument uh, will show that every torsor in this uh, symplectic group over any field uh, in the symplectic group of this uh, of B gamma and sigma gamma, will admit reduction of structure to the uh, twisted parabolic P2. Okay, uh, well, you simply you you take this subjection, you twist it. Okay, the subjection from uh, P to G, and then you go to the universal cover where it splits as a product. Then, because uh, we know B gamma is not split, then the symplectic group is not strongly isotropic. Therefore, if I have some parabolic which, uh, to which every torsor admits reduction of structure, that parabolic has to be the entire group. It cannot be a proper parabolic, okay? Because otherwise, the symplectic group will be strongly isotropic, okay? Uh, so that, that shows that P2 is SP4. And then you can repeat the same argument for SL2 here. Uh, you just change the bar invariant. I will leave the details to you. So yeah, that, uh, this is where bar invariants come in. I didn't have, maybe I have more to say, but I will stop here. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, I have a question. So why is it possible that some of the results are true and correct with T? Could you speak up, Erhard? Okay, let me change my microphone. I think the question was, why, why is the restriction on the characteristic, right? Where is that coming from? Is it possible that some results are true and characteristic T? Yeah, I, I believe most of the things are true and characteristic too. I am just, it's just because of my incompetence. So I don't, I don't know how to work with orthogonal uh, groups and whatever in characteristic too. That is why the restriction is there, okay? Because I did not go through that pain to try to remove it. It is my fault. 
Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Is there any hope of re extending these results to reductive groups that they're not semi-simple or is, do you think it's hopeless? So as you know, there is uh, in the preprint, there is discussion of this. Uh, I think the connection with the reductive case can be very well understood. Uh, and then on, in kind of all, in all particular cases, uh, you, you know, you can concretely, um, concretely decide maybe if a given reductive group is, uh, admits anisotropic torsus or not, but it comes down to understanding the Galois cohomology of this, all these twisted uh, uh, tori. And uh, it's, it's hard to, for me, it was, and, and they interact with the Brouwer invariant, or it becomes a wholeness. Uh, uh, but in specific cases, it is definitely uh, very tractable. I, I have another question. Uh, then, um, so, you know, so, so, take, take the, for simplicity, the semi simple, simply connected, mm -hmm. simply connected case. So as you know, uh, a such a group will decompose a product of, of very restriction, right? Yeah. And then is there a, is there a criterion for your notion of, uh, of this, uh, uh, I forgot already, I mean, this, this strongly uh, isotropic or something like that? So uh, a criterion for the group to uh, not- uh, uh, Yes, yes, yes. Is there, is there a dictionary taking account that decomposition? Um, so um, you're saying take a semi-simple, semi simply connected group over a, a field? Yeah, yes, and you decompose it, you know, in products in very then it is Then it is strongly isotropic if and only if uh, one, of the, one of the products is, one of the factors in the product is strongly isotropic. Okay, so you're talking okay. about the simple case. Yeah, yes, okay, so this is the generalization of your product things or your, yes, okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, if there are no other questions, uh, let's thank the speaker again.